We're going to cover two chapters today, and we're going to extract some things uh, that are pertinent to not just uh, fathers, uh, but men and, and, and women. But I'm going to try to uh, extract some of this uh, because, to be honest, um, you know what's interesting? This is just an interesting thing that just occurred to me this morning. On Mother's Day, the church will fill up. Because Mother's Day, the moms say, come to church with me. And on Father's Day, the church thins out because the fathers say, go to the lake with me. And um, we know, we know that in this country, it suffers under the weight of fatherless homes. They suffer. They just do. And um, so really one of, the, um, one of the kings, so to speak, that we haven't covered is the king that comes to just take fathers out, period. Just take the father out. Uh, leave the woman alone to fend for herself, to be independent, to not have anyone to protect her. Uh, leave the children uncertain about who they are. Take the father out and a lot of things deteriorate. So as we go through Joshua 11 and 12, um, we're going to see, this is the, 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 the final battle, if you will, in uh, the whole conquest of the land, the territory, and then there's an accounting of it. So I'm just going to read through it, and then we'll extract a few things here. Joshua chapter 11. Now, first of all, Tony did an excellent job. At the end of chapter 10, they went back to Gilgal and did a great job on explaining that the, uh, although the kings have been taken out, they'll creep back in, they'll come back up, and the last thing that we as believers should do is to creep into shame or to fall into shame, but to remember the cross. And, and what a great, great message that uh, Pastor Tony brought to us. But now it's time for them to go back into battle. And what has happened is, just like what happened in the last battle, these five kings uh, built a coalition against Israel. There's going to be another coalition that is even by magnitude much, much greater than the five kings. When Jabin, the king of Hazor, heard of this, he heard of the defeat that had just happened, he sent to Jobab, the king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Ashpoth, and the kings who were in the northern hill country, and the Arabah south of Chinnereth, and in the lowland, and the Naphtor, to the west, the Canaanites in the east, and to the west, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites in the hill country, and the Hivites under Hermon in the land of Mitzvah, they came out with all their troops, a great horde in number, like the sand that is on the seashore huge contingent of countries started to come against Israel. And um, it's interesting to me that um, it seems as though in our spiritual journey, transformation is really the, the whole process of our spiritual journey to become uh, more like Christ, less of us, more of him. Uh, yesterday, there was a funeral here, a, a memorial service here for Pastor Joe it was wonderful and there were so many people that had been touched by his, his ministry and there was one young man that sat in the back and I had a good chance to talk to him and he had uh, been in and out of mental institutions. He had been, uh, he'd been 40 years an alcoholic. Um, I mean, he was just telling me a story, but I'm listening to him. I would have never guessed it. He, he just was all together and uh, I asked him if he went to uh, AA, he says, you know, he says, for me, he says, it helps a lot of people. It really helped a lot of people. But for me, he goes, it would trigger me. He goes, nothing against it. I just was triggered by listening to the stories and I had to find another way out. And, and I said, so what do you do for your recovery? And he said, Bob, he goes, no, I, I don't have a problem with that word recovery. But for, for me, it's not recovery. Recovery is going back to where you were and start over. He says, to me, it's transformation. And I said, wow, that, that's really a good perspective. We're all in a transformational journey. 
right? All of us. And so when we, when we overcome something in our life, when something that we were struggling with and, and we had no strength of our own to go there and we begin to dig deep into Jesus and, and he gives us some strength that we didn't know we had and then we start to overcome something in our life, uh, we often will shrink back after that into a place of maybe just kind of like complacency or, or, or we feel like we've, we've overcome something and, and rightly, rightly so, we have. We start giving praise to Jesus and things like that. But then all of a sudden, out of the blue, here comes another frontal attack. Here comes something else. And it seems like in our Christian lives that God always presents a situation for us to fall on our knees. And so here, after they defeat these five kings and made a mausoleum in that cave of those five kings, we've, we've talked about them all. Now, uh, we can't put names to all of these kings. There's so many that have now come against him. And it's just like us, when we start to make some progress, there's another assault that comes our way. And this is what happens to them. And uh, so they joined all their forces. Um, and they, all these kings joined their forces, verse 5, and came and encamped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, I love this, I mean, when the Lord says this to Josh, he knows what's in Josh's heart, all right? He says, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. He knew they were all a coalition together and, and there were so many they couldn't count them as a great horde, right? He says, uh, do not be afraid of them for tomorrow at this time I will give over all of them slain to Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua and all his warriors came suddenly against them by the waters of Merom and fell upon them. Now, if, you want to, if you're in a geography, this is north of the Sea of Galilee. Chinneruth, where it says Chinneruth, is actually another word for um, Sea of Galilee, which actually means harp, a harp. And if you look above, down on um, the Sea of Galilee, it's shaped like a harp. And these waters of Merim were waters that would come off of Mount Hermon and kind of flood and then come down into to here. And this is where these armies were encamped. Um, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel who struck them and chased them as far as the great Sidon. And I, I really am struggling to pronounce these, so bear with me. Miserpoth, Miam, eastward as far as the valley of Mizpah. And they struck them until he left none remaining. And Joshua did to them just as the Lord said to him, hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. And everyone that, everyone that, that reads this, they go, wow, why would God have them take away some things that could have benefited them, like horses and chariots that Israel didn't have any? They didn't fight on horses. They didn't have chariots to battle from. And God is saying, I want you to hamstring those horses, which doesn't mean to kill them, by the way. It just means to take a tendon out so that they can't run. And then they could still be useful, right? But the chariots to burn them. What God was really saying here to them without saying it is, I don't want you to, to have an advantage other than me. And sometimes we use things in our life as a security, as advantage. Uh, even our work sometimes can become like an advantage to us. And, and God is saying, listen, I, I, want, I want to be elevated above your strength, above your security. So he has them take them out. And then Joshua turned back at that time and captured Hazor and struck its king with the sword. And Hazor formerly was the head of all of those kingdoms. And they struck with the sword all who were in it, devoting them to destruction. There was none left that breathed. And he burned Hazor with fire and all the cities of those kings and all of their kings Joshua captured and struck them with the edge of the sword, devoting them to destruction. Just as, this is important, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Israel burned, except Hazor alone, that Joshua burned, and all the spoil of these cities and the livestock. The people of Israel took for their plunder, but every person they struck with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they did not leave any who breathed. Just as the Lord commanded Moses, his servant, so the Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did. He left nothing undone, 
all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Like four times, none, 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 none. So Joshua took all that land, the hill, the country, and the Negbek, Negeb, and all the land of Goshen, and the lowland, and the Araboth, and the hill country of Israel, and its lowland from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir as far as Balgad, in the valley of Lebanon, below Mount Hermon. And he captured all of their kings, and struck them, and put them to death. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. It's said that that war lasted six years. There was not a city that made peace with the people of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, which we learned about earlier. They took them all in battle, for it was the Lord's doing. This is very, very, very important. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and they should re receive no mercy but be destroyed just as the Lord commanded Moses. And people look at this and they go, wow, I, maybe we should just not read that part. Maybe we should go uh, a little bit past that, past that because that's not the God I know. Yeah, it, he, that is the God that we know. And this is the way it works. Some people will harden their hearts towards God. They do that first. God doesn't do that first. Some people reject God. They reject even the, the, the creation of God. And, and they begin to reject anything that has anything to do with God, like the word of God, or even some people of God. And, and they fashion out uh, their own life. And God gives them chance after chance after chance. In this case, they, th these people lived here for centuries against God. And all he did, just like he did to Pharaoh, said Pharaoh hardened his heart towards the Israelites and then God, right, gave him all of these chances to repent, all of those plagues. And then he finally said, then God, God hardened his heart. And this is what happens. For anyone here that may not know Jesus, be careful. Be careful. Let him into that heart. Let him open your heart. Let him bring you to an understanding that he loves you, that he cares about you, that he didn't want you to be independent. He wants you to trust him. He made you. He knows what's best. And so when we reject that over a long period of time, then he turns us over to ourself. And we're no longer able to take mercy because he hardens the heart completely. And that's exactly what has happened here. And so he said, listen, it, it's kind of like Nineveh. Remember we were going through the book of Jonah and the same thing happened to Nineveh. They had all their chances, but they took that last chance and they repented. There's always hope. But if you're here this morning or you're here online and you're just like interested in God, just that's because he's trying to open your heart. Don't close it off. And if you do close it off, open it up today because there's coming a day where you won't have a chance to, just like these people didn't. That's why this is in the book. That's why there's instruction in the Bible, all right? So, where were we? <laughs> Verse 21, and Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim. Anybody know what the Anakim are? Anybody know? These were really big, tall people, otherwise known as the giants. The same giants that when they went in to take a look at the land, they said, there are giants in that land. They saw the Anakim. And now, just as Josh, Josh was told by uh, Moses and also by God that, hey, listen, don't fear them. I'm going to put them in your hand. I'm going to give them into your hand. And God's promises came true right here. And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deborah, from Anab, and from the hill country of Judah. They were everywhere. And from all the hill country of Israel, Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. You're gonna see this a lot in this, in this chapter, you've already read it a lot, where he devotes things to destruction. Here's something to remember. If you're devoted to something that God wouldn't co-sign, if you are devoted to something, you'll know your devotion is there because of your time, your talent, your money, and your resources. And if you're devoted to it, right, and you know that it wouldn't be something that God would have you to devote yourself to, then that thing will devote you to destruction. 
Your devotion will destroy you unless you turn and you devote that thing to destruction. And that's what we learn here all the way through the book of Joshua. And so if there's some things like in your life that, that you know are not good for you, not good for your family, uh, that it's time, there comes a time where God says, listen, you need to devote that to destruction. And you can't do it on your own power and your own strength. There was none of the Anakin left in the land of the people of Israel, only in Gaz and Gath and Asherah did some remain. There was a few. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to all their tribal allotments. And I love this. Hopefully you do too. The last little bit in chapter 11, and the land had rest from war and the land had rest from war. And so in the book of Joshua, all 24 chapters, that's the end of all the wars. It's their history. And so, uh, you know, Paul says that all scripture is God breathed, right? For the training of righteousness, for reproof and for instruction. So anytime we go through the book of of the word, the word, right, the Bible, then we should be able to extract things uh, to train us in righteousness, to right standing with God or to correct us away from things that we should be devoting to destruction. And you know what they are. As I'm speaking, the Holy Spirit is interceding and speaking to your very soul as to what those things are in your life that God's saying, look it, uh, I wanna help you overcome these things, but you need to devote them not to yourself, but to destruction. And then we hit chapter 12. Now, chapter 12 is an accounting of everything that happened. And I'm not going to read it because I just blubber all the way through in terms of trying to pronounce all of these kings. But what they do, what they do here is in chapter 12, verse 1, it says here, now these are the kings of the land whom the people of Israel defeated and took possession of their land beyond the Jordan towards the sunrise from the valley of Arnon to Mount Hermon. East. So these are the tribes or the land that was settled before they crossed the Jordan by Moses, all right? And so there were kings that were defeated before they crossed the Jordan, and they are listed here. All the kings that were in that land are listed, all right? And then we get to uh, verse 7, and it says, These are the kings of the land whom Joshua and the people of Israel defeated on the west side of the Jordan. And it gives you the uh, area of the land, and then it starts to list the kings. When it lists the kings, I want you to, uh, to follow along just for a second. Like in verse 10, it says, the king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lashish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Gezer, one. It's like God in this moment is using the writer to be an accountant. We went through five kings. When you get to the end of this, after the one, the one, the one, the one, when you get to the end of it, it, I'll finish it from verse 21 to 24. The king of Tanak, one. The king of Medigo, one. The king of Kedesh, one. The king of Jochaman in Carmel, one. The king of Dor in Naphtap Dor, one. The king of Goyim in Galilee, one. The king of Tizra, one. In all, 31 kings. 31 kings. I was, I was, uh, I want to say bored. I wasn't bored. I was kind of inquisitive and curious if I could put a name to all 31 kings. Like to try to come against Bob and my family and my wife. And there's way more than 31 because sin is rampant in our hearts. It can be. And so what does Jesus do? The king of all kings. What does he do, right? Let's read it. This one verse here or a couple. 
if I could summarize what he's done, and I can't, but I want to I wanna try to in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, 14, and 15. And you, Bob, Tim, Romy, put your name in there. You were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. It's interesting because Emily read about all of the ways of the flesh and how to turn against, turn away from that and allow the spirit to lead you. And so without God's spirit, we're dead in our trespasses. Without God's, uh, you know, sacrifice of his son, we're dead in our trespasses. God made us alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses. So one of the first kings that Jesus defeats is our deadness. He's made us alive. You guys, I can't. I can't tell you how dead I was without Jesus. And I was putting, I was, I was redeveloping carcasses all around me. I was dead. And it wasn't just me. It's all of us that are still trespassing without understanding that we're sitting against the holy God and the fallout of that. And that God would have his mercy to open up a sinner's heart to beg for forgiveness. That God would, would cancel that record and make us alive together with Christ. Don't ever underestimate that without thinking about it at times, without understanding the cost that it took to save one sinner. So he's defeated all of our trespasses, this King Jesus. We know that Joshua is a type of Christ and we know that he defeated uh, with God's help 31 kings, but never did he defeat death. Never did he defeat sin. Never did he defeat the devil. Jesus did. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. We're with him. He's our father. Having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of the debt that stood against us with its legal demands. The legal demand for the wages of sin is death. And he cancels that record. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He was nailed to the cross. In doing this, he disarmed all the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. What a victory that was. You can't put a number 31 or 1,001 or 10 million and one on that king. But that king wasn't defeated. That king defeated hell, death, the devil. Think about that. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever wake up in the morning and, and just pause for a moment and preach the gospel to yourself? Say, I, I don't deserve a life with Christ. But somehow, for some reason, he had mercy on me. He opened up my heart. He opened up my ears. He opened up my eyes. And now I can see very clearly which way I'm supposed to go. And even when I fall short, even when I wander, even when I am complacent, he continues to woo me and pursue us right back into this togetherness with him all over again. Think about that. That's just a huge quantity of grace and mercy. You know, today is Father's Day. If he is for us, who could be against us? We talk about protection. It was funny this morning, Emily was the only girl up here singing with all those guys. And uh, Chris was in the drum booth, he couldn't hear me. And I was trying to encourage Emily, I said, man, look at you, you're the only beautiful one up here this morning. And, uh, and then I, she looked at me, you know, kind of funny. And I said, look at how protected you are. You have all these men around you to protect you. And no sooner than just a couple minutes later, Chris being goofy, he comes out of the drum box and he grabs one of those turkeys and he comes up behind Emily and goes like that. <laughs> And M, M said, there went the protection. 
And sometimes we as men, we forget our roles as protectors. We just do, we become complacent. We forget. Thank God Jesus wasn't. Thank God Jesus didn't get distracted with other things. Thank God. And thank God he's reconciled us back to the Father. I love it in AA when they grab themselves, they grab their hands in a circle, all the men, all the women, Romy knows, I shouldn't point him out like that, but oh well. Uh, <laughs> you're no longer anonymous. Anyway, uh, sorry. But, you, but we stand there and someone will say, who is he? he was father. Our father, who art in heaven. And they, they pray the Lord's prayer at the end of every meeting, unless they play the pettiness prayer. Who is he? Our father. He's our father. Yeah, keep going. Hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it's not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so you should. You should keep coming back every morning to that place of recognizing the cost that he sent his son through for our reconciliation back to him. You know what's interesting is in the book there that we just read in those two chapters, you see that, that he gave this over to Israel. In other words, like Israel did this. He, he's, he's trying to help them build confidence, knowing that they couldn't have, I mean, they were, out of all the battles, they were, they were undefeated except for one battle which they failed to listen to what God asked them to do. God was undefeated. They were 0 and 1, right? And that tells a story too. And I want to go back in time, like in the time, uh, like a time machine, just a few years before. And we're going to go into Deuteronomy and then we're going to close. Let's go look into, in the book of Deuteronomy for a moment. Before all this was taken place, uh, God was speaking to Moses about instructions about what to do once they got into this land and how they were gonna be able to take the land and how important it was. And there's some specific instructions that, uh, I mean, this is not just for men, but, it, but in this context, I want the men's ears to be more open than ever, all right? It says, and you will indeed, in verse, we're gonna to go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, verse 13. You will indeed obey if you will indeed obey, if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then he will give you the rain for your land in its season and the early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give you grass in your fields for your livestock and you shall eat and be full. He's talking about when they take that land, when the land rests from war. Now think about this for us. He says, if you want this blessing to continue, love me with all your heart, love me with all your soul. And then he says something very interesting here. He says, take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall teach them to your children talking to them when you were sitting in your house and when you were walking by the way and when you lie down. That's a lot. That's morning, noon, and evening. And when you rise. He's saying, listen, this is, this is our lot. 
This is our heritage. Don't waste it. And if you go back to Joshua chapter one, verses two through six, he given the instructions. He says, I will give you all of this if you listen to me and you follow and obey all that I ask you to do. Partial obedience is not obedience at all. You shall lay up these words of mine in your heart, not mine, but his, in your heart and soul. You teach them to your children. Be careful, lest your heart be deceived. Deception comes differently these days. There are more, I shouldn't say it like that. There are some Christians, they believe in God, and, and, and they, have, they have some semblance of a relationship but if they're in transformation, right, uh, they should be more interested in their spiritual growth than their worldly and earthly growth. They just should. Your life depends upon it. I've talked to couples that, that, are, uh, that, that had been uh, in a place where they shouldn't be. Let's just leave it this way. And I said, you know, if we could see, if, you, if you, 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 your relationship was in a boat, if the two of you are in a boat, we can't see it in the natural, but if we could look at it in the spirit because you are disobeying God right now, it'd be like you guys are floating around in a boat with a big hole in it that you can't see and you're taking on water all the time, but you just can't see it. It's the same thing that God says here. Listen, this is important. If you want, if you want blessings, right, then just do what I ask you to do. Does that mean we'll be absent from trials? No, but what, during the middle of the trial, that, process, that, that produces more transformation instead of angst or anger or, or more trouble. And so some of us, right, are, are kind of in a deceptive place where we're pouring into our work and not the word of God. We're pouring into, uh, you know, hobbies or special interests and, and thinking that that's the greatest thing that our family could ever have. And he said, we, we should be talking to our children about these things when we wake up and when we sit down and when we go to bed and when we rise up. And I think all of us would, would not, I would say all of us, but many of us are falling short in that category. Now, obviously, they were agrarian society. They weren't as busy as, as we are. But you know what? Uh, if we really stop and, and, and test ourselves, we could, we could probably extract some of the things that we're doing that are never eternal and replace them with things that are. Just think about that. You know, I do a lot of weddings. And when the man comes up here, and he slips a ringer on his wife and the ringer. The <laughs> That's another dad joke. That was a disguised dad joke right there. Yeah, right. Anyway, when he slips the, the ring on her finger and I say, repeat after me, you know, that uh, I, 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 I pledge to protect you. I pledge to protect your heart. How can that man possibly do that if he's not protecting his own? How could he do it? And so that first song, surrender, just surrender to the Father. Repent and say, you know what, I, man, I, I, I'm not putting you first. And, 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 and I'm, I kind of like this life of comfort. I kind of like this life over here, all these fun things that we do and all the stuff that we, you know, that we do, all the stuff. And yet he's saying, listen, this is really important. If you want the rain to fall, <laughs> if you want your crops to grow, right? If you want your, the heritage of your family to be represented in the next generation, then, uh, you know, uh, you might have a trophy on the wall when the kid was in Little League. And they look at it when they're 50 years old and they go, wow, that's, that's what I got from my family. My father, once I found out the story that he wasn't my real father, he became a hero to me. He was heroic. 
to take on a, a me who uh, wasn't his own, but uh, I would have never known, right? He did some amazing things as a dad, and you can do amazing things as a dad without the word of God. But you can't do the most amazing thing as a dad until you plant the word of God in your heart. Because it kind of tells you which way to go. It's going to tell you which way not to go. And then when you're in a community with other men and women and you're in the body of Christ, then you have this opportunity to, to understand that you're not alone in these struggles that we talked about this morning. Because I can tell you that the common problem for men is two. One is you're distracted. The second one is you're complacent. You just get lazy. And I can tell you that our adversary that roars around, he's like, he's like doing anything he can to keep you from picking this up and reading it to your wife or reading it to your family. Or what about this? Reading it to yourself. He's doing everything he can. I mean, there's so many of these laying around people's homes and unused, unrepresented. People say, well, Bob, I, I can't understand it like you do. Yeah, well, it's because you haven't read it enough. Ask the Holy Spirit to open up your heart, your mind, and what little bit you can understand, just sit there and camp out there. Can you understand the scripture that says that he gave up his life for you? Just camp out there. Can you understand that scripture that, you know, without him, you have nothing? Just camp out there. And then share that in the morning, in the noon, in the night to your children. Tell them the story about Jesus. I mean, who cares if you can read and, and know that Chinnereth means, uh, you know, the Sea of Galilee that looks like a harp. What good is that? But when you get down here and you go, hey, Bob, God speaks to you and says, hey, don't be afraid. Take that verse. Don't be afraid. That's a good father. And then when you stand up and, uh, or I wouldn't say you stand up, but when you, you're next to the graveside of a brother or a sister that fought a good fight, then you know that they fought a good fight, but never, never as much as the sacrifice of Jesus fought for them, the conquered hell, the grave, and the devil, and all the principalities and powers that would like to take you out. And the only real, real weapon we have, right, is our relationship with him and the word of God. So fathers and men, women, anyone else in here, uh, if you want to continue to be transformed, right, then devote yourself to things that should be devoted to. And devote those things that you might be devoted to, that you shouldn't be devoted to, to destruction. Just devote them to destruction. You know, uh, I, 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 I don't say it to boast, I say it to kind of tease people. They say, Pastor Rob, you busy this week? I said, yeah, I have three weddings and a funeral. <laughs> they go, really, three weddings and a funeral? I said, yeah, it's not a movie, it's our life sometimes, right? And one of the couples that are married are right here. They were married this week, Emily and Connor. Uh, uh, Hunter, Hunter, Hunter. That was my dad joke. And, uh, and, and, and I saw them come in and I go, what a great way to start your marriage. Good job, Hunter. Right before you talk about when you, when, you know, you talk about when you start to make progress and, and then there's resistance, right? Is it okay if I tell them what happened to you the week that you were getting married? Is it okay to tell them what you do for a living? Yeah, so he's a sheriff's deputy. And a guy ran through a red light and T-boned him just a few days before he got married. And, uh, you know, we have to be ready. 
we have to be prepared. We have to be willing to understand that there is resistance. There are things that are going to come against us. I have a few right now that I'm working on. I really, really do. And I'll always be working on them until I see him face to face. But when I get complacent, when I get distracted, they're working on me. And I need other brothers' help. I need my wife's help. I'm not afraid to admit it. So if the ushers and uh, worship team would come back up, we'll take communion. So <clears throat> if I was to summarize like, like the message, I would say this, be your own accountant. Like in chapter 12, one, 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 all the way to 31. Be your own accountant. And number one, start listing the things that God has done in your life. Start listing the things that, the things that you would like him to do in your life and list the things that you're working on right now in your life. And then if you want, Make a list of the number of times that you sat down with your children and talked to them the way God instructed us to. And don't beat yourself up on it. Don't beat yourself up on it. But just know that that's God's intentions for all of us. That's his intention. You know, uh, we do a lot of uh, premarital counseling and uh, we ask the men, do you, you know, are you prepared to pray with your wife? Are you prepared to read the word of God to your wife? Or are you prepared for these things? Uh, no, not really. And then we read Ephesians and then we talk about what the guy's responsibilities are. And then we do marital counseling later with people. And we say, are you praying with your wife? Are you reading scripture to your wife? No. And I would tell you, if I, to be honest, there is a low number percentage number of men that are actually doing that in their household with their wife. Why? Because it's a front on attack, assault from hell to keep you from doing that. And that needs to be devoted to destruction. I just being honest. Did you hear what she said? Say it louder, Lisa. Stand up. My husband and I have been married over 30 years, and he started that a few years ago, and um, it's made a huge difference. Five, ten minutes in the morning, reads a chapter, and we pray for the people that we love. There you go. There you go. Good job, Don. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. <laughs> No, seriously, it's, it, it, there, there's something, there's resistance, right? There's resistance to transformation and uh, we can't be complacent and, uh, and we can't be distracted. We just shouldn't be. In Joshua chapter 11 that we read, verse 15, I want to highlight this one verse as we prepare for communion. It says, just as the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so did Joshua do. He did it. He left nothing undone all of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. When Jesus was in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he said something very, very similar as he prayed to the Father. He said, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Thank God Jesus didn't shrink back. Thank God he accomplished the work that the Father sent him to do. You know, uh, if I could just motivate the men or encourage the men just a little bit more before we take communion. Many of you men have amazing gifts that God has placed in your very DNA Right in the very heart of who you are, he's placed those gifts for the kingdom, for your family. And you'll never be able to, you know, to, to uh, experience them, right? In a place of complacency or being distracted. But when you 
pick up that Bible and you may not know that God has actually given you a gift of teaching. You don't even know until you pick it up and you're starting to share. You don't know that, that God may have given you this, this huge gift of administration to where you can start doing things in order and in preference that God would, would, would love. Many of us don't know. Many, many men just go through life just living, living your life out, not even knowing that God has given you gifts for the kingdom. But you have to come out of that place of isolation or complacency or distraction in order to really discover them so that God can really be glorified by you men. That's my hope. That's my desire. I remember there's a young man here. His name is Alex. Alex is... 20, I think, real, real short guy. And, and, uh, he works at Sam's club with you, Patty. And, uh, he came in here one day and turns out I knew his uncle. Anyway, started coming to craftsman for Christ and going through a lot of struggles in his life. He starts to read the word. He starts reading the Bible for himself. And one day when Stanislaw and his wife was here from Ukraine, Stanislaw caught him by the door and he grabbed him by the neck. He said, God has things for you to do. What are they? And he woke up. He's like, he woke up in that moment. And then he goes, Pastor Bob, did you hear that? He said, God's going to give me something to do. And I said, yes, I hear that. I can't wait to see what he has you to do. And it wasn't but a few weeks later that he stood up at men's camp and he said something very profound. And it wasn't a few weeks later that Kevin had him stand up here and, and open up the word to all the men, 20 years old. And then he did it again, why? Because he discovered that, wow, God's given me a, a message. God's given me purpose. He's given us all that. But it has to do with the kingdom. And the kingdom sometimes starts right in your own household and your family. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this bread and this cup, this covenant that you created and cut with your life, that you poured out your life so that we could have life. Help us, Lord, to be grateful for that and for understanding now the life that we now live, we live for you and not just for ourselves. I pray for everyone here, not just fathers. I pray for everyone here this morning that you would nourish us, that you would protect us, that you would be the overseer of our souls, that you would be our avenger, you'd be our champion. Thank you, Lord, for triumphing over the grave and over sin and over the devil. We take this, Lord, because you told us to. What an awesome opportunity we have to have this meal with you this morning. Let's eat and drink together.